Good evening. This is Mae Bressel in Carmel, California. It's tape number 450, July 18, 1980, side one of the tape. Uh, for those of you that have been regular subscribers to these tapes for quite a few years, there's going to be a change of format. It won't affect the new listeners as much as it will the older ones, at least for the next few weeks to come. I went off the air at KLRB in Carmel two years ago, in 1978, in May of 78. There were various reasons that I went off the air, and I do have tapes available th available for those of you that don't have them. The last tape that I did from KLRB, except for guest appearances, was May the 14th, 1978, called The Serpent's Egg, explaining why I was transferring from the half-hour news service to an entire hour of broadcasting because I didn't feel that a half hour was long enough and there were personal reasons, th certain threats around us that I felt I should get off the air a live time spot on the station and go to the tape cassette newsletter. But so many uh, events have taken place that pertain to the continuous series of broadcasting that I've been doing for the past nine years. The Reagan nomination, the uh, wanting to overturn the abortions in the United States, the escalation of the nuclear plants as against solar energy and so forth. I'm getting so many phone calls and letters and requests that I decided to go back on to KLRB. Now, the broadcast will be Sunday night from 10 to 11, one hour a week. The news will be identical to what I've been doing on the tape cassettes, except that the cassette machine will be plugged into the station and you will receive the tape you receive will be what is on the air that week. Now there's been a two year lapse time wise in information. Stories of the Pope from Auschwitz or Operation Condor or Alternative 3. These are new terms for people that have not kept up with the work that I'm doing. There's a large audience from Santa Cruz and Watsonville, Salinas, Carmel, Monterey area and also down in Soledad. And uh, these terms are totally unfamiliar to them because the major sources of news in the area don't carry very much about the current books, the space programs, or literature about possible genocide and the topics that I cover each week for you on the tapes. So there will be a little bit of repetition, but not much for the sake of you that are regular subscribers. I will just... Uh, turn them on to the list of past broadcasts that we've done, tapes, and they can order those as other people do if they want information on those subjects. They can get the back orders and get the list from me. The tapes that I make here go out every Friday, so there'll be a two-day delay making a broadcast on Sunday night. I will get it to the tape center Monday. Uh, I believe that they're closed on Mondays here, so that maybe it's Tuesday it will be mailed out to you instead of on the weekend. So is, there is that difference you will expect after July 27th. That will be the first broadcast, that there will be that delay of a few days. It isn't that anybody took your tapes or the mail interfered. There will be a three or four day delay, and then they'll come the same day every week after that, hopefully. But there will be that change. And for many of you, I promised an overview one tape with an overview of why I do the work, what I have done, what I have discovered, how I got into the work, the sources of information. And it may be next week as an introduction, getting back to the air with a whole new audience in addition to some of the older listeners, that I'll just do an overview. I'll see how the news goes next week. There were a lot of deciding factors in going back to KLRB. I think one of the most important factors was a man who called me several weeks ago and he listened to my uh, KLRB shows that were later aired every week on KZAP in Sacramento and he has an uncle that lives in Honduras and he remembered what I had said about the Nazis and many broadcasts about the Nazis and the Kennedy assassination and when he was in the Honduras with his uncle the subject came up of Joseph Mengele's that man is the notorious criminal from World War II, the angel of death, they called him at Auschwitz. He's the subject of the book, The Boys from Brazil. He lives in Paraguay and Uruguay. He's between Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, Argentine, and Chile. Traveled all around South Central America and uh, did experimentations. For all we know, he could be doing them continuously today, physical experimentations on twins and blue eyes and genetic experimentations and 
he determined as people went into Auschwitz who lived and who died. Uh, he was known as the Angel of Death, written up, as I say, in many, many books, Joseph Mengele's. And when this particular person was down in Honduras asking his uncle about Mengele's, he had the feeling that his uncle was a war criminal or never apprehended during the war, but a spy for the Nazis at the Oakland uh, base. And it reminded very, me very much of the book Sabotage that I have reviewed or mentioned on this program and given you the title of that book by My Michael Sayers and Albert Kahn. And he described the activities of his uncle during World War II and that uh, he had reason to believe that Mengele's was associated with his uncle, the both of them around 89 years old, he believed. And the subject came up from what he told me on why was Joseph Mengele's never hung at Nuremberg. Mengele's is a well-known name. They make uh, farming tractors and farming equipment in Germany. And Mengele's was living very comfortably, quite wealthy after World War II for four or five years and wasn't recognized or identified or even sought at the time of the trials of Nuremberg. It's uh, a, a fact that Mengele's, when he was recognized, fled down to South America and uh, supposedly had continued his experiments on human beings down in South America. And when the subject came up with the uncle, why wasn't Mengele's prosecuted at Nuremberg, the answer, according to this person, was he was an American citizen. And that's why he wasn't tried as a German uh, person in the War Crimes Tribunal. The Americans were trying the Germans and this person told me that Mengele's, uh, according to his uncle, was an American citizen. So he proceeded through the Freedom of Information to get information on Joseph Mengele's, and he called me to tell me what he discovered. And it was this discovery that I want to share with you today and uh, this evening, and also to explain that because he was able to follow this through and get this information, and because the contact was an unknown person, not somebody I knew uh, through correspondence or otherwise, but who I had influenced to develop at least some sense of uh, curiosity on this subject, I decided that I should be back on the air reaching as many people as I can because all of us combined may be able to use our energies and intelligence to come up with continuous pieces of information that put the puzzle together of why we're headed towards World War III and hopefully uh, use that same intelligence and energy to expose some of the people that are leading us down that path. I suppose you want me to talk about Ronald Reagan and the uh, Republican Convention this week, but I'd rather talk about Joseph Mengele's because Mengele's works with the people that nominated Ronald Reagan, that will work with Ronald Reagan. Um, I'm going to share with you what he got from the FBI through Freedom of Information Act and give you a copy. The FBI report dated December the 8th, 1966. Director of the FBI to the director from the Los Angeles office regarding Joseph Mengele on November the 15th, 1966, and this part is blanked out. They advised that he recently received, the FBI agent received the following information. Recently, a man stopped in the office of an attorney in Las Vegas named, and that's blanked out, and advised that they wanted Nazi war criminal Joseph Mengele, the, the wanted criminal, is masquerading under the name of Harold Endenen and resides in Riviera, Arizona. This community is supposed to be five miles south of Bullhead, Arizona. Checking with the Auto Club, I find that Bullhead City is on the Colorado River near Davis Dam. The FBI wrote that, which really has nothing to do with Mengele's at all. Continuing the report, it said the informant stated that Mangles is masquerading as a construction worker. He has dyed his hair, has scars, has plastic surgery. The informant refused to identify himself to, and the name of the attorney in Vegas is there, who has offices at, and that's blanked out. Harold blanked out. Further advised, the name may be spelled Endeman, E-N-D-I-M-A-N. The FBI agent's names are blanked out. The attorney in Las Vegas is blanked out, but the endeman is there. It goes on, the files of the Los Angeles office reflect that one, and they have another alias, and it obviously can't be Harold Endeman or Endenen because they've already stated that. Aka Joseph Mangley was the subject of a report of special agent, and they blocked that out. 
um, uh, dated February the 9th, 1944, in New York City, New York. He was the subject of denaturalization proceedings, apparently because his name appeared on a Nazi party list. And the final sentence of this document, or next to the last sentence, Mengele's was naturalized. Naturalized American citizen, December the 5th, 1932, U.S. District Court, Southern District, New York, under certificate number, and that's blanked out. The Los Angeles office has no, proceed, no information concerning the results of the denaturalization proceedings or whether Mengele's ever became a bureau fugitive. Now, to get this straight, Joseph Mengele's in 1966 was in Las Vegas, Nevada. 1966 is the year that Robert Mayhew, uh, head of the assassination teams for the federal government under the guise of the Hughes Organization, from 1960 on, they had worked with organized crime, John Roselli, Sam Giacana, and Sheffield Edwards, the American team, William Harvey, James Angleton, and the assassination teams. Mayhew worked with the FBI and the CIA, who was from Boston. He came out to Vegas and to work for the Howard Hughes organization. 1966 is the year that there was no Howard Hughes, but which the organization moved in to take over the syndicate, the skimming money, the tables from organized crime, and combine it under the cloak of the Summa Corporation that made the tool bits, the Howard Hughes organization for drilling oil, and also multi-government contracts for escalating the war in Vietnam, which began as soon as John Kennedy had been assassinated, and the airplane aerospace industry began to build its muscles with contracts as soon as the a chance of withdrawing from Vietnam was pulled away and the war escalated. So the year that Megley's was in Nevada was the year that the Hughes organization took over the state of Nevada, literally took it over. And of course the senator from Nevada, uh, LaSalt, who manages the Ronald Reagan campaign, whose name you heard very much on television this week, was in Nevada, and this particular lawyer, whose name is blocked out, should be revealed by the Federal Bureau of Investigation if he was working with Mengele's or Robert Mayhew or Paul Lizald or anyone from the Hughes organization, because I've claimed all along that that is the umbrella cloak for the Nazification of America and the world if they can succeed in doing it. Now, the name Harold Endeman, and Harold Endeman is important because somewhere in my many files, and I don't have the material alphabetical the way I should. I uh, don't have anybody to help me, and sometimes I, I don't have time to cross-file articles. Many times I don't. So you have to put your thinking caps on and see if you come across the name Enderman or Endenen in your work. Now, as far as the denaturalization proceedings, he was the subject of a report in 1944 in New York. Uh, the book by Reese, The Nazis Go Underground, tells about in May of 1943 when the Nazis realized that they could not win the war against the Soviet Union and members of the Gestapo and the highest ranking Nazis began to break away from Adolf Hitler's organization, at least on the table, not really, but to retrench for that World War III, to rearm, to arm the world against the Soviet Union one more time, which is where we're heading now. So that the important thing is that, that in 1944, many of those Nazis could be traveling around here. They were working with Alan Dulles and uh, Chase Manhattan Bank and the OSS that became the CIA and John Foster Dulles, and the very team that put Hitler into power. It didn't want Hitler to lose the war that wanted to make an agreement with uh, Great Britain to go in and fight the Soviet Union. We're begging Franklin Roosevelt to uh, arm you know, with Germany against the Soviet Union. Those people were very active in the United States in 1944. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover was vice president of Interpol. He worked with the Nazis. He worked with Meyer Heydrich, who was one of the three men that met in May of 43 when the Nazis went underground. So that the fact that the FBI writes a report in 1966, this was before J. Ho Edgar Hoover was dead, saying that the FBI had no information whether or not the denaturalization proceedings ever took place or whether uh, Joseph Mengele's was a fugitive, bureau fugitive, leaves it quite open and raw that they didn't even consider him a war criminal. Uh, the U.S. District Court of New York City 
uh, made him a naturalized citizen, according to this report, in 1932, Joseph Mengele was a United States citizen. In the book Aftermath, uh, Ladislas Fargo describes a lot about Joseph Mengele. You can look up in the index and in the other books on Nazi Germany about um, Mengele. But I tried to get a chronology of the years. He has a tale of how Mengele left Germany, how he lived in Germany successfully. And then he describes part of his life in South America, and he goes to an episode, nothing happened. Uh, it was fairly quiet. And it, it was a time period until 1965. And then 12 young Jews in Brazil had banded together, Fargo describes, and they wanted to kidnap Mengele's and the men were discovered and all their throats were cut uh, from ear to ear. They were seen floating down the river with their arms outstretched as if they were crucified. And it goes into the death of these uh, people that wanted to get Mengele's. And then there's a jump in years and it suddenly, uh, on the next page of this book, uh, Aftermath, suddenly it seemed that Mengele's moment of truth was at hand in the summer of 1968. A secret agent from Brazil uh, called a soldier of fortune came calling on him. He was using the name Dr. Erico. Well, in this detailed chronicle of Nazis after World War II, Farago jumps from 1965 where there was this attempt to murder Mengele's, kidnap him and murder him, and then the people that were going to do that were caught and had their throats cut. And then he jumps to 1968. So that could explain that Mengele's, after uh, the confrontation with those people, did come to the United States in 66 and was in the United States for a time because there is this uh, jump in time that isn't explained. And he could have been in Nevada and he could have been in Arizona. Also, uh, the fact that they knew that he was living in Arizona, the FBI, wrote a report that he was living in Arizona in 1966 is important because Sedona, Arizona is a place I've discussed on radio programs before. Uh, I got information about a person who was involved in the John Kennedy assassination who was taken to a trailer camp and it's a compound on private territory where he was controlled and turned into a zombie and his memory erased and there are mind control experimentation places in Arizona and in Sedona, Arizona and also as soon as John Kennedy was killed, Marina Oswald was taken by Priscilla Johnson, who was her CIA control agent, to Sedona, Arizona. And Marina's memory was literally erased if she wanted to know what Lee Harvey Oswald did or didn't do. Uh, when she was pushing the book for Priscilla Johnson called Marina and Lee, she would ask Priscilla and look to Priscilla on television or on radio and say Priscilla knows more about Lee than I do. Marina Oswald was taken another time to Sedona, Arizona and uh, uh, it was a great, supposed to be a re vacation for her, but I did get information from people when I was doing a lot of work or interest in mind control, which I'm still interested in, particularly as it related to the people involved in these various assassinations and Sedona, Arizona, as well as other places in Arizona, is a place for experimentation. And the FBI knew that Mangles had other names and um, was capable of being in the United States and weren't even aware of whether or not he was a member uh, of the Nazi party that should be deported. They didn't know about the denaturalization proceedings, but the American people were never told that he was a naturalized citizen. To lend more credence to this story, um, there is this new book out that I've referred to, and I'll probably be, be going back to it many times, The Untold Story, the new book by Charles Hyman on Errol Flynn. And in that book, he tells about the Nazi, the member of the Nazi party, who got Flynn working for him as a member of the Gestapo. His name is Dr. Herman Friedrich Urban, described as a violent anti-Semite, a strong love of Adolf Hitler, he grew up, according to Hyman, in fiercely anti-Semitic atmosphere of Vienna, and uh, Mr. Urban's uh, identification cards have been verified by the U.S. government in the National Archives and elsewhere as being part of an espionage ring of the Gestapo. While he was working for the Gestapo, he also was a member of the Rockefeller Institute and studied at the Australian Department of Aborigines and worked with the Rockefeller Institute. He joined the Nazi Party, according to Hyman, in 1922. That was the year before Himmler joined. 
and became the head of the Gestapo. And then Urban took up residence in the United States. Two years before he joined the Nazi party, he'd come to the United States, but he joined the party in 1922 and then came back to the United States. And November the 10th, 1930, in San Francisco, he took his American citizenship and swore allegiance to the United States of America, being a member of the Nazi party over in Vienna. And so uh, he was studying tropical medicine, traveling all over the world. But he came to San Francisco, 30 to 31, and got his passport uh, in California as an American citizen. And I mentioned a new book out about the Tsar's family coming to San Francisco and a first cousin of the Tsar working at the Hoover Tower with the Reagan cabinet, the men that Ronald Reagan would use if he becomes the president. And the Tsarists and the white Russians and um, the Nazis have accumulated at the Stanford University and the Hoover Tower the memorabilia and the active files of the Nazi party continuously ever since it was formed. And uh, this group banded together are the Tsarists and the Nazis. And so that San Francisco seemed to be the stopping place when, when the Tsarists left Manchuria and went to Shanghai. They arrived in San Francisco so that the coast here has been the center not only of warfare industries and aerospace and uh, spaceship planning and Rockwell and the various uh, multinational toys, the war weapons and the space weapons covering California and the coast of California. But San Francisco was the recipient of the Nazis and the Tsarists and they combined evidently on the west coast. We were growing more than oranges and uh, uh, fruits here in California at the time. I think we we thought of California as a, maybe a garlic center, artichoke center, and fruit, vegetables, and lettuce, and so forth. It's a large agricultural state, but along with that has been the nucleus of the warfare state. And you can see why, if these people had moved to San Francisco and set up their headquarters, how important uh, these wars, the planning of the war against Russia, another time around, the Germans lost twice, Napoleon lost twice, and Japan several times and the combined energies from California that have been pushing the Richard Nixon and then the Ronald Reagan ticket come from this nesting ground out here. So Urban was in the United States. He got a citizenship in San Francisco, then traveled around disguised as a white Russian, traveling Marseille, Shanghai, and uh, Manila, got involved with drug smuggling, and uh, which is a typical part of the Gestapo work, the combination of the drugs, narcotics, morphine, and so forth. And then Urban, this uh, Nazi scientist, met up with Errol Flynn and was instrumental in England and in the United States and around the world with uh, their Gestapo spying and their violent anti-Semitism. So if a member of the Gestapo from the very early days of its formation was an American citizen, it's very easy and possible for Joseph Mengele to also pick up citizenship papers so that he had the protection in case Germany lost the war of not being prosecuted because he was an American citizen. He wasn't charged as a traitor to America and he wasn't charged as a German citizen for war crimes. There's a very good book out that I'll be referring to over and over again on various tapes uh, in the future called The Interpol Connection, an inquiry into the International Criminal Police Organization, and it goes into our FBI, the CIA, Nazis, KGB agents, uh, drug dealers, and Watergate connections. And the link of Jedgar Hoover, the FBI, to the Nazi organizations and the protection of the Nazis uh, is an interesting story that I've just briefly touched on from time to time, and we could spend a lifetime just delving into those links. But these books are available, and the fact that in 1966 the FBI was so casual about Joseph Mengele's in that uh, alias that he had. He had over 20 aliases, but the fact that he was in Nevada in 1966, when the user organization moved into Nevada and uh, was in Arizona, is important. And the cavalier attitude of the FBI about covering up his American citizenship instead of being outraged or having an all-out alert is important when you see that document. I compare that FBI document on Mengele's to the one they sent out about me in 1967. Uh, those of you that have that tape, I did 
on that FBI document might remember that uh, in 1967 there was an alert to all agencies of the FBI to begin files, to start files on May Brussel for the Secret Service, the FBI, and uh, the various government agencies because I was afraid of fascism and had stated it publicly. Those were their words. She even stated it publicly. Uh, Mengele's wasn't a danger to the United States. May Brussel was a danger. There was an alert to begin files on May Brussel not to look for Joseph Mengele in Arizona or in Nevada. Last, uh, just several weeks ago in the New York Post, there was another article about Errol Flynn and his role with the Nazis and the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. This was sent to me from the New York Post. Uh, from listeners in New York. Top secret documents from the British intelligence reveal that in 1937, Errol Flynn brought Nazi leader Rudolf Hess and Martin Bormann to Paris to meet the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. Hess or his double, one of the two, are still in that lonely jail in Germany, and Martin Bormann, of course, was the author of the continuation of Nazification under the Bormann Brotherhood after World War uh, II was winding down to get ready again for World War III and this process of turning the world to becoming Christian that is going on with our leaders in this country is part of that same movement. But Martin Bormann and Rudolf Hess, according to this article, met with the Duke and Duchess of Windsor and that Errol Flynn was the man that made the introductions. This article says this extraordinary role in the meeting bug by British agents is the latest shocker in the story of Errol Flynn's Nazi connections. Charles Hyman was on the radio in San Francisco and I heard him at the time and while he was on the radio a woman who worked with British intelligence called him and offered information about the wartime files of M5 and M6 from British military intelligence and Charles Hyman continued um, contact with this person who then went to the files and got Flynn's activities from 1934 to 1953 when British intelligence kept an eye on him. He arrived in London in August 1937. That's when he was working with Dr. Urban, who, as I say, had the American citizenship, who was a Gestapo member, and according to Charles Hyman, there was an intelligence alarm set out that the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, who were always pro-Hitler, they were very much in favor of the Nazification of Europe, had met Errol Flynn was the person who was introducing Martin Bormann and Hess to the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. This article from the New York Post says that Errol Flynn uh, was traced to the Hotel Maurice in Paris where the Duke and Duchess of Windsor had a friend, Charles Badeau. That's whose chateau they were married in, and he was a very wealthy industrialist and Nazi collaborator, and he was in a Miami jail in 1944 awaiting charges of treason, and according to the New York Post article, he commits suicide. I imagine any witness to a Nazi collaboration trial that involved the Duke and Duchess of Windsor or Errol Flynn or Martin Bormann or Rudolf Hess wouldn't have much value in terms of uh, life expectancy. You would expect that he would die in a Miami jail before he broke the connections of this notorious combination of Hess, Bormann, the great hero Errol Flynn and so forth. Uh, according to the New York Post article, Errol Flynn was seen in Paris with the Windsors and they discussed pro-Nazi British aristocrats, getting them to line up with Adolf Hitler, getting England to line up with Adolf Hitler, and that uh, Hyman claims that uh, Flynn's image as an adventurer, or an unwitting friend, or a Nazi sympathizer uh, was just by uh, a happenstance that he just fell into a trap with members of the Gestapo. Is totally untrue. He worked with the Nazis, the, the French Nazis, the British Nazis, members of the Gestapo, American citizens, American traitors, but this Dr. Urban that worked with him or the American Joseph Mengele's, if he was in fact an American citizen, makes the rise of Hitler even more insidious than ever. The, the story of Adolf Hitler's uh, being put to power by people by Henry Ford, the Rockefellers, U.S. Steel, the major corporations, Wall Street, and the rise of Hitler, there's a whole book, many books on that, uh, is bad. But then the law enforcement agencies that did not come forward and tell the truth about those people and their naturalization and the role that American Justice Department, the FBI, played in protecting those people 
is notorious. We know that the role of the agencies has been notorious in studying the murder of John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, the civil rights leaders, even the shooting recently of Vernon Jordan. They don't drag their feet, they assist the criminals. But this behavior of the justices, the police, the FBI, the federal agents to find criminals is just a cover for their supporting these criminals, these genocidal policies. The blame for genocide or murders or deaths can't be put on the shoulder of Adolf Hitler alone or on... I know a lot of my regular subscribers to the tape cassettes would like comments about Ronald Reagan and his running mate, George Bush. But I'm going back, as I say, on KLR next week, and I think I'll just reserve my opinions of the ticket. Those of you who are familiar with my research know pretty well what I think about that ticket. And uh, for the others, I think I'll just reserve my comments and calm down a little. Right now, I just feel like puking. The one encouraging thing about their candidacy is that I was listening to the news yesterday, and they were describing the television reporting during the Republican convention, and I think overall the network coverage, only 27% of the listening public listened to the Republican convention. And when Ronald Reagan arrived in Detroit, according to the news service, uh, there were some soap operas on, such as Hospital and other uh, shows out here on the West Coast at that particular time. and. People called in and they were furious and angry that they interrupted the soap opera with Ronald Reagan's arrival in Detroit. So if that gives you any inkling, I hope that just those 27 percent are the only ones that go to the polls. Uh, and I hope you don't get divided between an Anderson or a Carter or turn against Carter the way the media is turning you. God knows he's horrible and he has Brzezinski breathing down his neck like a dragon but uh, there's a Congress that's balancing out or cooling off Brzezinski after that ridiculous uh, failure trying to get the hostages. But my, I'll have a lot to say about Ronald Reagan for weeks and weeks to come. I've talked a lot about Jimmy Carter and the narcotic connections, but I think I'll wait to talk about the Republican conventions and more on Ronald Reagan next week where we can share uh, again with the audience here on the West Coast because it will be important to get as much out as we can about this beast up till the point of the elections. Not that what May Brussels says is going to affect the elections in any way, and I have no illusions about that, but yet information does have a way of seeping around to people who might otherwise uh, vote differently and hopefully influence more of you who are not registered to get out there and vote. And don't be so cool and think that a non-vote is a protest. A non-vote is begging the next four justices on the Supreme Court to be appointed by Ronald Reagan. There's a new book out, uh, an uh, uh, interesting book. I don't have it. Sometimes I give you information about books that are out and you get them before me or at the same time that I do, but I want to alert you to them because sometimes they're off the stand before they ever get uh, known. They get out and somebody sweeps them all up. So before I even get to them, I have to alert you at times. This book that I, I'm uh, reading about now in the newspapers is called Jack, The Struggles of John F. Kennedy, an author by the name of Herbert S. Parmet. And it's a new book that claims that uh, John Kennedy was living with a suspected Nazi spy. He was working in the Office of Navy Intelligence during World War II. That was a time period where his father was hoping that Joe Kennedy the older brother had become president of the United States, and there's a book out on the possible murder, the sabotage of the airplane that he was killed in. And there was uh, a lot of concern. Joe and Kennedy's father was ambassador to the court in Great Britain and brought home because he was so pro-Nazi. J. Edgar Hoover he thought he was an embarrassment. Even the director of the FBI and vice president of Interpol didn't want Americans so overtly Nazi. It was supposed to be under the tables and Joe Kennedy was brought home, and John Kennedy was with a woman, I've heard these stories before, Inga Arvid, a Nazi, and uh, the excuse for bugging John Kennedy uh, when he was in the Office of Navy Intelligence was that he was with this woman who possibly was a Nazi agent. 
the book describes that uh, she was four years older than him. He was 24 at the time. He was single, and the FBI had suspicions about her. She attended the 1936 Berlin Olympics with Adolf Hitler, and Franklin o Roosevelt had ordered the agencies to bug Kennedy, John Kennedy, because he was going with this woman who was known to be a Nazi. And according to stories that I've heard before, um, Joe Kennedy had his son switch to the South in the Pacific in the battlefield to get away from this particular woman, maybe because of her links to Adolf Hitler. But he was sent out where he was almost killed on that uh, boat, wrote a book about it. His life was almost ended over in the Pacific. But uh, the book brings up the subject that Ginger Hoover had a chance to blackmail John Kennedy from 1942 until the time of his assassination in Dallas. That he had tape recordings of him evidently uh, making love with this particular woman, and uh, while well, he became a hero on the PT 109, his romance with a known Nazi was in the hands of J. Edgar Hoover from 1942 and until 1936. Now that is something that uh, the blackmail and setting uh, various people up, young people, with uh, women, Nazis, narcotics, uh, or whatever, uh, is common to the FBI. It was common to Adolf Hitler. Uh, it was common to the politicians in the United States, in Las Vegas, New York, Miami. It came out at the time of Watergate, the intent of John Mitchell, the Attorney General of the United States, to fix various members of the Congress up uh, on boats and at the convention. Democratic convention and what they would do is take young people, young aspiring congressmen and photograph them and bug them making love and with uh, various women and then later when they run for office they can pull them out 10, 15, 20 years later and blackmail them and switch their votes and get them to vote the way they want and control them because of their expertise in bed or whether they're disloyal to their wives. In this case John Kennedy wasn't married but um, he was with a known Nazi. There's an interesting uh, telephone suicide pact discussed in the newspapers that uh, I thought we should call attention to. Sometimes we talk about strange deaths that don't get too much attention. This was June 14, 1980, just a month ago. From Switzerland, a Swiss industrialist and his divorced wife died in a suicide pact made by telephone minutes before he was to be arrested in a suspect of a $62 million fraud case. Officers arrived at the luxury home of Bulgarian-born A. Pinkas, P-I-N-K-A-S, shortly after he killed himself. Probably he took cyanide. There's a disease called, I mentioned many times, apparent heart attacks. This is probably cyanide. His former wife, Florence Molas, killed herself, probably, at the same time in Cannes, France. Police confiscated documents at the Pincus home. They claimed he caused damage to more than 10 Swiss and foreign banks, as well as private persons, and obtained $62 million in credit through falsified banking sheets. Pincus came to Switzerland as a chemistry student in 1941. Before the end of World War II, he discovered a revolutionary method to industrialize production of nitrous oxide or laughing gas. Pincus had chemical plants throughout Europe and Latin America in the 1960s. He was on the board of directors of seven companies, including a local bank. He and his wife were divorced for tax reasons, but maintained close relationships. I think it's interesting that he uh, supposedly swallowed this poison in Switzerland. His wife took the same kind of poison in Cannes, France. Nothing conclusive about their deaths. He worked for a chemical country, but the company. But the important point, I think, is where did the $62 million go? Uh, lately, if you've been reading the newspapers, you see $2 million, $4 million, $10, 14, $20 million swindles, such as the Michael Sendona case with the $45 million swindle at the Franklin National Bank in New York. But where is the money going? Is it going to the rightist military forces? Uh, controlling this fascist organization around the world. There's unlimited millions and millions of dollars going around, and people like this, when they're about to be arrested or indicted, are found dead from apparent cyanide poisoning, but absolutely no proof that they weren't murdered. There was an article in the New York, not the New York Times, the Washington Post, 
this last April that I haven't been able to get around to you. I have so much information and files I want to share. But this has to do with the death of John Paisley, and those of you that study the John Kennedy assassination and keep up on that may not have been aware that there was an intelligence report. The Senate Intelligence Committee came out with a report this April investigating CIA official John Paisley. He died in September of 1978. And the latest report of the Senate Intelligence Committee claims that the critical question of whether John Paisley was murdered or commit suicide will remain a secret. The committee chairman, Birch Bayh from Indiana, and vice chairman, Barry Goldwater from Arizona, uh, were part of this committee. Keep in mind that Arizona is the state where Joseph Mengele's resided uh, under the nose of Barry Goldwater in Arizona. Now, John Paisley, um, I did an article for Penn Jones on John Paisley's death at the time the House Select Committee on Assassinations was doing their work. And I have several tapes on that going back to 1979, tape number 372 and 373. The House Select Committee on Assassinations was hearing the story of Yuri Nosenko and a Mr. Hart from the Central Intelligence Agency was allowed to testify before the Committee on the Conditions that he didn't talk about Lee Harvey Oswald, but he was talking about Nosenko, this Russian defector who I claimed worked with uh, Lee and Marina Oswald in the Soviet Union. And the very week that this testimony was going on, September the 15th, 1978, was at the time of the testimony of John Hart from the CIA before the House Select Committee on Assassinations. And a week later, John Paisley, a man who worked with Lee Harvey Oswald and had to have access to his information in the Soviet Union was found dead. September 23, 1978, Paisley was dead, and John Hart was just testifying on September the 15th. Now, the House Intelligence, the Senate Intelligence Committee, is telling us in 1980 that they will not reveal whether he was murdered or commit suicide. And yet we know that John Rosselli had testified for, for Senator Church's committee and was murdered right afterwards, and Sam Giacana, who was test to testify before the Senate about the assassinations in the United States, and the CIA was murdered a week before he was to testify. And Sheffield Edwards had testified, and William Harvey had been murdered. The fact that witnesses before the Senate Intelligence Committee are murdered just prior or after their testimony is important. You, all you have to do is add up the amount of deaths of people testifying and they can't pass off, they do pass off, but they shouldn't be able to pass off a statement that whether he was murdered or commit suicide will remain secret. The point I'm trying to make is that the assassination teams that made it possible for Adolf Hitler to get into power in 1933 are nothing compared to what's going on right now in the House of Representatives in the Senate of the United States in 1980. And yet we're literally unable to extricate ourselves from the reality of the everyday world to that kind of thing that's going on in Washington. If you want to understand how Hitler came to power, just look at your own hopelessness or helplessness right now. There's nothing we can do. They sent a report. There's no credible evidence other than a suicide, and yet I have documents that they should Word statements, there's no credible evidence into the investigation, for example, of a conspiracy with Jack Ruby, because we did not look into it. Therefore, we can say there's no credible evidence. They admitted they delayed in fingerprinting the body. They cremated it without his widow seeing it. They uh, covered up the importance of Mr. Paisley with the Central Intelligence Agency. They covered up his relationship to Lee Harvey Oswald in the Soviet Union. The body was weighted down, 38 pounds of weights, shot in the head, thrown out in the river one week after the testimony of not only John Hart of the CIA, but Hart was close to Paisley. John Paisley and his wife, both Marianne Paisley, worked for the CIA. The immediate superior in the CIA to Marianne Paisley was Catherine Hart, the woman whose man, husband was testifying before the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Catherine Hart and John Lyman Hart Marianne Paisley and John Paisley were all very close, as was Yuri Nosenko, the KGB agent who actually worked for the Galen operation and for the Central Intelligence Agency. So you have uh, John Hart talking about Yuri Nosenko, and the man 
who really would know the connections was John Paisley. A week after Hart testified, it was never cross-examined, of course, Paisley was found dead. All of that happened in 1978, but in 1980, the Washington Post reports that the Senate Intelligence Committee has informed the widow of John Paisley that they will not disclose it will remain secret whether he was murdered or commit suicide. The top article in the Washington Post says full report on Paisley's death is to stay secret. The Senate closes the probe on the XCI agent and keeps it a secret. The same intelligence committee keeps it a secret on Leo Ryan's death in Jonestown. A member of the House of Representatives, the man who formed the watchdog committee on the CIA, the used Ryan bill to stop counterintelligence is murdered down in Guyana and the Senate again and the Intelligence Committee covers up that murder. So the John Paisley story is not over. It's not closed for you assassination buffs in case you didn't know it. The full report is to remain secret which is tantamount to saying the man was murdered but the committee back there of course would refuse to make the connections between the Hart testimony, the role of Hart to Paisley Nosenko and Lee Harvey Oswald and the reason it's closed is again it would go back to the murder of the President of the United States and that is something that cannot be opened up until most of the main people involved are dead. That includes people like Robert Mayhew, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, uh, John Cooper, the remaining members of the Warren Commission. It will take another 10 or 15 years until they're dead for the truth to really come out. I mentioned a few weeks ago that uh, the head of the Los Angeles Police Commission, President Stephen Reinhardt, was considered for a judgeship and the uh, Senate Judiciary was supposed to pass upon his qualifications. The Los Angeles Police Department has been described as one of the most homicidal in the United States. There's reports out on the police department in Los Angeles and their shooting of blacks and minorities that they not only shoot but they shoot to kill, that they aim and get and kill almost more than any other police department in the United States. There have been investigations in Washington, D.C. of various police departments. As I've mentioned before, these aren't local city or state problems. This is a national problem. And uh, this particular judge was cleared by the Justice Department that the gentleman testifying against him, one of the main witnesses in the Abscam investigation, the informant Joseph Hauser, has been ruled aside and Reinhardt was cleared by the Justice Department. An article in the Los Angeles Times that followed said, the United States refutes its own informant and backs the nomination of uh, Mr. Reinhardt. I can't believe it, but I guess, again, I can, that here's a man who's been named by a top informant working with Carlos Marcello, the assassination teams that organized crime and the mobsters and links a president of the Los Angeles Police Commission to that gang and uh, the judiciary again says he's qualified to be a judge in Los Angeles. There's another article interesting. This uh, Maxine Cheshire has some wonderful pieces of news in her column. It comes out every week in the Washington Post. She's been writing the society section for the Washington Post for a long time. And she had an article on one of Jackie Onassis's new boyfriends, Maurice Templesman. I don't know if you saw that article or not, but uh, this article says that if she hitched up with this man, he's richer than Aristotle Onassis. He's politically powerful. He's secretive. He's head of one of the world's largest mineral concentrariums in the United States, France, South Africa, and Japan. And he's a close friend and business associate of Mobutu and uh, Zaire, where the Germans have built many rocket systems that would cover or control all of Africa. When Germany wasn't allowed to build these rockets, they were allowed to build them in South Africa. Jackie's new boyfriend, according to this story, owns 80% of the world's richest copper and coal bile, uh, mines in Zaire. He has minerals, United States, France, South Africa, and Japan. He is heavy into diamond mines, Sierra Leone, and so forth, oil rigs in Texas. Texas. He owns an oil company in Dallas, Texas. But the important thing is not only his extreme wealth and his mobility and his secretiveness, but Jackie Onassis is uh, going with a person who is very close personally and funded Richard Nixon's campaign. Uh, that fits very much into the Jacqueline Bouvier 
Kennedy uh, story, the, the saga that I've put together through the years of the role of the Bouviers in betraying France in espionage, their links to Napoleon, to the rebuilding and resurgence of the armies that would fight the Soviet Union someday. Somehow Jacqueline uh, attaches herself to some very important people that were involved in assassinations and assassination teams. If John Kennedy was under surveillance by the Federal Bureau of Investigations from 1942 on and was in the Senate moving his way up politically and Jacqueline Bouvier is a photographer who comes to him and uh, marries him. Uh, their marital relationship was always cold. He always had other women to play around with. She apparently couldn't care less, which isn't true. Most women don't react that way. She was with Aristotle Onassis just before John Kennedy was murdered. She was over in Greece. Onassis was right back with her. Um, as soon as the assassination took place, he was the first person in the White House, I understand, with Jacqueline Onassis. Another link of uh, Onassis, there's many links of him to the assassination teams and the murder of John Kennedy and the people around John Kennedy and the Nazi organizations. But uh, Johnny Meyer, who was the press agent for Aristotle Onassis and Howard Hughes, worked for Howard Hughes in Aristotle Onassis also, was very, very close to Errol Flynn and the Gestapo. This whole can of worms of Nazis, assassins, and the death of political leaders, many of them, including John Kennedy, is a close, very close-knit clique. And in the middle of it always is Jacqueline Bouvier Onassis. Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy Onassis, I should say. As I say, Charles Hyman, in the book on Errol Flynn, the untold story about his Nazi connections, refers to uh, Errol's pimp and henchman Johnny Meyer. That's the man that worked for Onassis and for Howard Hughes and uh, worked with Errol Flynn, and he tells how Johnny Meyer met his death in 1978, I believe it was. It's in the book how he was repairing a car and the car went backwards and crushed a Meyer. That was in Florida. Just, um, oh, while Watergate was unfolding and a lot of scandals were coming out and exposés of Howard Hughes and so forth, a very important connecting link to all of these stories was run over by his own automobile that crushed him, came rolling down on top of him and crushed Johnny Myers after this infamous and scandalous career with all the biggies. Speaking of current deaths, I don't know if you noticed in the newspapers, there was a Reuters story, not in the American newspapers. Cardinal Pinadoli, official at the Vatican, died. According to Reuters, the Cardinal was one of the main Italian favorites, a candidate to become the Pope after the death in 1978 of John Paul I and uh, then John Paul II, after 34 days, took over. Remember the cartoons about the poisoning and the killing of John Paul I? And then the Polish Pope, handpicked by Brzezinski, became the head of the Vatican. This man was the Vatican ambassador to Bolivia and Venezuela. He's been a cardinal since 1973, but was suggested as one of the main favorites of the Italians. He quietly died, the cardinal, just several weeks ago. There also has been a follow-up about the attempted murder in Fort Wayne, Indiana, of Vernon Jordan of the National Urban League. Indiana is the home of the Tom Charles Houston plan, the uh, combined military intelligence CIA Defense Department uh, plans for wiretapping, bugging, counterintelligence, and terrorism. Indiana is the home state of uh, Senator Lugar, suggested as a possible vice president to Ronald Reagan. Luckily, he wasn't put in. Uh, there's a foundation in, in Indiana, Bloomington, Indiana, that Spiral Agnew is the head of, a neo-fascist organization in the home state of Jim Jones, where the nucleus, not only of where the SLA was formed, but the mind control program that was to be instigated in Guyana with various American citizens that would be shipped down there for experimentation. So it's no wonder that Mr. Jordan was shot at of Fort Wayne, Indiana, now, there was an article just two weeks ago in the newspaper. Three men in a car were following Jordan, and the FBI said they could have shot him. Returning to an early theory that a carload of men who were shouting at Mr. Jordan and Martha Coleman could have shot him is now coming out again by the FBI. Uh, he was with a white woman who works for International Harvesters. She took him to the home for a few minutes, but this could create the motive, a white woman uh, taking him to the Marriott Hotel. They were yelling at him 
and uh, then they shot at him. If it wasn't a well coordinated conspiracy concealed by the FBI as the FBI hid the John Kennedy assassination of Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King, they could have found those cars with those people. There were three white men who allegedly were angry at seeing Mrs. Coleman, a white volunteer with the local Urban League, in the company of a black man. That would take it away from a national and international conspiracy into three men that just didn't like to see white women with black men. It doesn't explain, explain how they escape the police network. It was similar to the shooting of Dr. Marcus Foster in uh, Oakland at the time he was shot when the SLA shot him. He was with a white man. The black man got cyanide bullets. The white man uh, survived and uh, was not killed. And weeks before, the Klan and the Nazi party had handed out brochures about this combination working together. So the intent was that the fatal bullets hit the black man. So in this case, the woman wasn't shot. It was similar to the SLA shooting or the Dr. Marcus Foster shooting out here in Oakland. Uh, the FBI knew about these people. They knew about the car. They knew that they had yelled at them. And when they went to the Merritt Hotel um, and they got out of the parking lot, Vernon Jordan was shot. And now, weeks later, even though the shooting was May 29th, they're admitting, yes, that car could have been the one with the assassins in it. You know, these assassinations and uh, uh, wiping out of witnesses and constant killing of important American citizens goes a long way back. It didn't just begin yesterday, and it's not going to end tomorrow, but it's something that we have to be made aware of, of how often it's happened, and begin to add up the statistics, not individual biographies or obituaries of people, but a continuous series of how many political scientists, how many civil rights leaders, how many black students, uh, how many rock musicians, and so forth. Uh, there was an obituary of a man named Paul Hall. He was president of the Seafarers Union. The Washington Post described him in this way. In the late 1940s and early 50s, a major problem on the waterfront was racketeering. This was during World War II and right after World War II. Mr. Hall and his union cooperated with the New York State Crime Commission and set up penalties, including dismissal of peoples that were involved in narcotic smuggling. In 1949, an effort was made to frame Mr. Hall by planting a quantity of narcotics in his automobile. In 1954, there was an attempt to assassinate him. What Mr. Hall wasn't aware of or probably caught on very quickly to was the fact that organized crime was working with the OSS, the CIA, that the violently anti-communist Sicilian Mafia and the syndicate have always worked with the defense, the police, against labor, against uh, civil rights movements, and so forth, and can be used as assassination teams, hand in hand. So when a man begins to break up racketeering or smuggling in, in New York City or wherever it is, then they planted narcotics on him and tried to murder him. The murder attempt was foiled, luckily, but the point is this goes back to the 40s and 50s and the same methods of getting rid of people who catch on to these various conspiracies has been continuous. It's been going on for a long, long time. There was a murder in Texas and the covering of a material and forging information and framing a young woman that is important. I thought I better bring up on these tapes because it may later, later turn out to have something to do with the John Kennedy assassination. A woman named Phyllis Pearl Tucker, 52-year-old woman, manager of a Dobbs House restaurant in Dallas, Texas at the airport, was found murdered and the police and the law enforcement tried to blame her daughter. She has a daughter, Tammy Lynn Harrison, 17-year-old girl, and they forced a confession from her about her mother's murder. And as the story became uh, more open and in the news, they discovered that the testimony against her had been uh, forced, that she was forced to confess, that she was threatened, and that the crime had been forged by the Dallas Police Department, and that according to the latest reports, there were three other people with motives to kill Tammy's mother, but the motives have not yet been disclosed, and may, they may never well be, unless we get into them and discuss them on the air and uh, throw this around. According to a large article in the Los Angeles Times, the whole investigation was messed up by police officers. Prosecutor Henry Wade, 
who prosecuted the case, uh, who tried Lee Harvey Oswald in about four hours and found him guilty of the murder of John Kennedy, was one of the people who prosecuted this and said that she was the one who did the murder. The young daughter asked for a lie detector test. They had refused to give it to her. She said she didn't murder her mother. And the attorney representing uh, her is Bob Hinton. Hinton is the law partner of Phil Burleson, and Burleson was the co-counsel with Melvin Belli for Jack Ruby in the Lee Harvey Oswald case when Jack Ruby was prosecuted for killing uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. The woman who was murdered, the mother of the young girl, was married to a Dallas police officer, Donald Tucker, and Jack Ruby was very close to members of the police department. And uh, I think it's interesting that they tried to cover up by uh, forging papers, forcing a confession. The Dallas police officers tried to cover up the murder of a woman who was married to a police officer who was also murdered and blame it on her daughter. An interested lawyer took the case and has cleared her. But the important thing, again, is that the law enforcement were actually involved in forcing confessions, forging papers, blaming a 17-year-old girl for murdering her mother. And all the while, these people could have had played a part in covering up the Kennedy assassination, and they selected the daughter as the patsy. Our time is up again. This tape runs around too fast. I'll be back with you next week, and as I said before, we will be on the air. You'll get the tape a few days later. Take care, and we'll go more into the Republican convention next week. This is Mae Brussel in Carmel, California, and have a good week.